Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. It's time for another book haul and in this video we're going to be taking a look at seven classics. Um, see how many you've read, see which one takes your interest. So without further ado, let's dig in shall we? So the first book on our book haul is the Russian classic Eugene Onyegin by Alexander Pushkin. Now this book is classed really as the forebear of all modern Russian novels. It had a deep influence on Lamentov, on Tgenev, on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, but it also pushed on to a lot of the Western literature as well. Now this book, with its lovely cover, the two pistols, because there is a jewel in this book, is from Alma Classics. And actually all of the books in this video are going to be from Alma Classics. They have a lovely cover. It's quite a, a sturdy card that you can see here, sturdy card cover. So obviously you are going to get the, the uh, sorry crack down the back of the book um, as you read through this, but it's not terrible. And sometimes with the stiffer card covers, you don't get a very good flop. Now, as you can see, this is brand new, so there's no flop at all here. But if I were to pull it open, there you go, I've, I've snapped the spine now. It holds really well, so the binding is actually very good. The font within the Armour Classics, I've noticed, fluctuates. Some of the font is quite sizeable and well-spaced. Uh, some is a bit smaller. The font on this one is, I don't know if you can see, is smaller. And you will also notice that this edition has the English this side and the Russian translation that side. So if you're any good at Russian, you can have it at its original, which is nice. So what's it about? In this story, he has Onyegin, who is a dandy, so well-dressed. His life revolves around decorum, dress, balls, soirees, parties, and indulging in sort of the delicacies of life, you know, the privileged elite way of whiling away their time and living off credit kind of thing. Now, near the beginning of the book, Onyegin's father is dying and he passes away, leaving Onyegin his whole estate. And so obviously he goes down to have a look at his estate in the country. And while he's there, he meets this dreamy, starry-eyed poet called Lensky. And they form this really nice friendship. Lensky is affianced to a girl called Olga, and Olga has a sister called Tatiana. They're different in character, but Tatiana falls for Onyegin, and she wants to, and she bravely puts herself forward uh, towards him to tell him that she loves him. And he gives quite a terse response, um, which is actually classed, it's actually called in literature, Onyegin's Sermon. Now, the fallout of that is seen later on in the book, which I'm not going to go too far into, but needless to say, he meets up with Tatiana again at a later point, and their lives have altered. Also, there's a falling out between him and his friend Lensky, which gives you the jewel, which is why you've got the pistols on here. But what happens there, and how does it affect the two of them? Pushkin, as I say, is, is classed as the granddaddy of modern Russian literature. Um, but obviously he was influenced by the Russian poets. He was a poet himself. He writes this in, in Pushkin stanza. And so many people that read it are moved by it deeply. Uh, a number of my favourite booktubers like Eugene Onyegin and Alexander Pushkin. So have you read this book? Do you intend to read it? It's not actually that long, because when you consider that this goes up to 363 pages, but half of those are in Russian. So the actual book is half of that. So what's that? 181 pages. It's not a large book to read. So I'm really looking forward to getting into this. This particular translation focuses more on the lyricism of the Russian poetry rather than on its exactness of translation, which Nabokov, he did that translation, but some found fault with it because it lost the melody of poetry. So that's number one, Eugene Onyegin by Alexander Pushkin. Next up on our Alma Classics book haul is The Great Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. Just gotta give a mention there, what a brilliant name Makepeace is. 
I've never met a make piece in my life, maybe you have, but I would like to shake one firmly by the hand just for having such a wonderful name. Now, Vanity Fair, it's, it's sort of one of the crowning achievements of Victoria literature. It's sort of set, it set the entire base for the Victorian domestic novel, really. Um, it was very hugely influential in literary circles and has rightly got its place amongst the classics. The title of the book takes its name from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian, the, the protagonist in that book, finds various obstacles and digressions and distractions on his way to good Christian truth. Now, one of those places is a village called Vanity, in which there is an endless fair, and it represents worldly materialism and being obsessed with the joys and pleasures of life um, as a distraction against the pursuit of God and spirituality. The phrase Vanity Fair entered into the English language as quite a popular idiom, which through time has had different meanings. In William Makepeace Thackeray's day, I had to say his full name again, I just love it, in his day, Vanity Fair really was viewed as the world as your playground for the rich and the decadent, those who could afford it, those who lived a life of idle pleasure. That was Vanity Fair. Now, the story focuses in on Becky Sharp, Rebecca Sharp, the daughter of a poor artist who yearns to live the high life. And she goes to a school where she meets Amelia Sedley, who is a much more calm and thoughtful character, but comes from a very uh, prominent and rich family. And so after leaving school, Becky meets with Amelia and she goes back to Amelia's home where she meets her father and meets her older brother and the dashing Captain George Osborne, who will feature quite prominently as well through the novel. And it's about seeing Becky Sharp using her wit and her good looks and her wiles of seduction and femininity, working her way and manipulating situations through Regency England at the time of Waterloo, the Waterloo battles, the Napoleonic battles are going on at this point, and it goes all the way through Waterloo and what happens afterwards. And not only there, but her antics in France, in Paris as well, the seat of fashion. And Becky Sharp wants to reach the top. This chronicles sort of the hypocritical, stuffy, unnatural aristocratic setup which governs the elite and how she wants to break through it. But all the other nasty little characters that you come across along the way, all with their own agendas, all with their own problems, some going from rich to poor because of bankruptcy after the, the Waterloo battle, love triangles and disappointments, enmities and jealousies, good intentions and bad intentions, and the whole facade and mask of an elegant looking world. This is a topic that a lot of the classics treat. You find this constantly coming up. The fraudulent impression of a glitz and glamour world, which hasn't changed a single bit to this day. People still really are obsessed with the Vanity Fair. In fact, there was a magazine called Vanity Fair. There's a lot of magazines called Vanity Fair. But this is sort of the original exposition of the idea of the world as your playground and is getting to the top and having riches and prominence and prestige really worth it. So, have you read Vanity Fair or is it one of those books that's been on your shelf but like War and Peace is so big that you've always put off reading it? Well, Vanity Fair is 763 pages in this book and the Alma Classics comes with a load of annotations to help you out along the way. So, that was number two, Vanity Fair by William, wait for it, Make Peace Thackeray. Third on this month's book haul is Anatole France's The Gods Want Blood. Have you heard of this book? Have you ever read anything by Anatole France? This is a Nobel Prize winner in literature, Anatole France. In his day, he was absolutely magnificent. He, he was one of the shining lights of literature from 
the latter part, so the 1880s through to 1910s, I think he died in 1921, is a very influential writer. Uh, the Gods Want Blood is set in the terror. That is the revolution of France when Madame Guillotine was taking off lots and lots of heads. And it follows the protagonist, um, Evariste Gamelin, who believes in the need to remove the aristocracy and to reform everything under the new republic. And he, he believes in liberté, égalité, fraternité, and all of those ideals, and believes that the people's courts and the, the, the new government are going to bring about fairness and prosperity for all. He's a real idealist. It tracks his progress as starting from someone who is sort of like a student and really believes in the ideals of liberty. And then, because of his zeal, how he gets drawn into the public courts themselves and becomes someone who has to pass judgment on whether somebody lives or dies, whether they are a friend or an enemy of the Republic, this very dangerous time. There are also a little group of characters that revolve around Everest himself. Now he has a mistress, Elodie, whom he loves, and he finds out that she had a former lover who caused her a great deal of misery. When he gets power, how will he use it? Will he use it for personal revenge? Does power corrupt? There are other characters whom he knows who are more well-to-do. Another character he knows who is part, I think he's a monk, um, or at least an abbot. Of course, the terror had a problem with the church of its day, and it was trying to bring everything under the auspice of the state, so that the state could dictate what society would be like, how the nobles would carry on living, and how the church would operate in harmony with the republic standards. And you just see how Everest, due to his ideals, due to his absolute belief in the Republic and all that it stands for, how to be consistent, he becomes a part of the terror. I think there's a sentence in here that talks about him um, being so true to the ideals that he will become a terror himself. And you see what happens to the people around him and how he sort of changes his view towards them and how they respond in turn and who actually has the moral high ground. It's a very, very provoking book. It's one to muse over. I wouldn't say it's a book that's going to set your world on fire. It's a book that's definitely, if you just read it for a story, you'd probably be disappointed. But if you take the time afterwards to sit back and really think, because the Revolution of France is viewed as, as a great event from our perspective, but if you were really there, what was it like to be on the wrong end of it? Um, what, is justice ever accomplished, even with the best of intentions? And are idealistic objectives safe for anybody? It's a very, very interesting book. It adds itself to the ever-growing library of discussion and commentary on human government causing more injury than benefit. So that was the next book. The Gods Want Blood by Anatole France. Our next book is a really well-known classic. It's a title everyone has heard, and it's by Joseph Conrad. So do you know what book I'm going to mention? Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness is a novella. It comes in, this book in particular, I mean, it's got lots of annotations in it, but the actual story is only 85 pages long, but boy are those pages claustrophobic and dense and thick and grimy. The narrator is Marlowe. Now, if you've read any of Joseph Conrad's works before, Marlowe features in a number of the books. He's a man that's constantly been at sea. In fact, he's the narrator behind Lord Jim, which is a book I absolutely love. And in this, he's sort of sitting on a boat at night docked on the Thames in London and he's just talking while others go to sleep about an expedition he made um, on, a, on a, a tramp steamer up a river in Africa during the time of colonisation. 
It doesn't say it explicitly, but the country he's talking about is the Congo. And that adds a nice bit of background if you really want to go in deep to the book, which I'm not doing here. Now, Marlowe was accused of being an out-and-out -out racist by Chinua and Ichibi. Now, I don't know the argument there. There's a book that I want to read by him about that. But I certainly don't get that idea from Heart of Darkness. But unfortunately, it has had the effect of be making this one of those books that some want to cancel. Because as you go through this book, there's no sense at all that Marlowe, the narrator, and hence Comrade, the writer, approves of the things he describes. In fact, you get the sense that he strongly disapproves of everything, but like a good writer, he tries to keep the narration neutral, not to leave his imprint as a writer on the story itself, but to leave you to consider. But Marlowe, he first of all goes to this town. It's, uh, it's not named the town, but if you research it or look carefully at some of it, it's, it's Brussels in Belgium, which tells you it's the Congo because the Congo became the personal fiefdom of King Leopold II, I think it was, of Belgium, might have been the third. Anyway, he goes on a big journey down to Africa and he eventually stops at this sort of manky port and there's explosions going on where mining's being done and there's just this small clearing and there's an office he has to report to and he's told they want him to go up the river and find an ivory hunter called Kurtz. Now Kurtz has become something he's demented but he's, he's a mysterious character, he's the best ivory trader there is but he vanishes for long times into the wilderness. And there's rumors about him coming down the river. And now the company want him to come back because they fear that he's setting himself up as some kind of king uh, with the natives. There are some very distressing scenes which are so dispassionate about the suffering of the black natives. Um, but again, Marlowe doesn't pass judgment on it. He just tells it in such a matter of fact way that it's almost painful to read. What is the heart of darkness? Is it because it's Africa? The old phrase of the 19th century, darkest Africa? I don't think it is. Who is Kurtz? Is he a literary reflection of the King of Belgium? What do Kurtz's last words mean when he says, oh, the terror? Through the whole book, you are hemmed in just on the river. It almost drives the narrator mad because it's just this impenetrable jungle on both sides, just the river that he can go up with small clearings where he bumps into other traders who are just avaricious and greedy. And it, it breaks down the link between colonization and civilization because let's face it, a lot of the um, excuses for going and colonizing for the French empire, the Belgium empire, the German, the French uh, and the British, it was based on, we're going to civilize the natives. However, wasn't it really just to rape and ransack the land of its resources? And here you get a narrator who flies his own flag. Marlowe is never ever invested in the state powers. He's never invested in the company he works for because he, he moves around and works as a, as a sailor for different people, just as his needs require and he just records what he has seen and lets you, the reader, draw your own conclusion. Personally, I think he was trying to wake people up to just how barbaric the colonization events actually were and what the root cause was for them, which is nothing more than greed. And again, just like most classic literature, it speaks to us because that has not changed one bit. There may not be colonization anymore, but is there the exploitation of humans? Yes. So The Heart of Darkness is a very um, dividing and provoking piece of work, which if you've got a day to spare, you might want to read. Um, just be warned that there are a couple of upsetting scenes and it's, it's not to everyone's taste, but it is a classic and has lasted for a reason. So that was the next one, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Comrade. Have you read it? 
How did you get on with it if you did read it? Was it a struggle? Did you find it really hard? Or did you enjoy it? How long did you take to think about it? Because this is a book that you'll want to walk around for a week afterwards, chewing it over, to really say what was Marlowe's message and who was Kurtz? Who does he stand for? Heart of Darkness. The fifth book on this Alma Classic book haul is the great American novel, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. 600 pages long. I, I love the cover to this, sort of an old advert, as it were, calling people to go to see. Um, what can be said about Moby Dick that hasn't already been said? It's not everyone's favourite book. There are great swathes of sort of cetacean trivia um, that you go through in this, because Melville wanted to make his character Ishmael, the most famous of opening lines in a book, call me Ishmael. He wants him to be a real character, because this book explores the meaning of human nature and deep spirituality, the relation between the inner world and the outer world. In fact, it had such a potent effect on so many authors after Melville wrote this. And to get that realism, he gives you tons of research on whales and their lineages and how to identify different ones of them and their measurements. Uh, in fact, there is part of it where Melville wrote to a friend and said, the problem here is blubber is just blubber. You might make oil out of it, but it's just blubber. And it's hard to make exciting in a book. The story itself is the tale of Ishmael looking for more adventure. He's a man who gets bored easily, he tells us, and he always wants to have adventure that might put his life slightly at risk. And he's heard about the whaling boats and that it's a dangerous life. And he thinks, I'll go and work on a whaling boat where he is signed up to the Pequod, the famous boat, of whom the captain is Captain Ahab, who has a fixation on a particular whale, a white whale called Moby Dick, which has wrecked fleets of ships before, and Captain Ahab has met and been injured by before and wants to seek his revenge on this massive beast. Um, he wants to hunt it down, it's an obsession. But there's so much symbolism in this book. Um, where do you even begin? There is such glorious prose in here. Um, how do I say this? I think Melville said that the poetry in his writing was as stiff as maple sap in the middle of winter, um, which, is, which is a great phrase. But some, there is a sermon given in this book before they set out to sea. And it's about Jonah. But it's just one of the best bits of writing I've ever read. And... It's not exciting, it's not thrilling. In some respects, you could put it to one side, but the book would be very much poorer for it because this is all about life. Life is like a boat. That's a phrase that's been used many a time before and Melville's picked it up and run with it. Society is like the ship of state, we call it. It has all of its levels. Um, it's hierarchy down to the lowest, you know, in the engine rooms or, or in their case, you know, the ones who are just going to be the common oarsmen and whalers. This is how life is. And so by cramming everything onto this whaling boat, Melville gives us a snapshot of life and relationships and the reaction towards institutions and formalisms and expectations and law, rigidity, independent values. He not only does that, but he, he gives it a broad scope linking the whole world. Because they set sail from Nantucket, which is not so high fly, for instance, as London or Paris or New York but it was the centre of the whaling trade. And you have the real down and earthy characters there. And people who work on these ships to be captains are brave, but they also tolerate no dissent. And the whaling industry and the whaling fleets of Nantucket were quite democratic in many respects because anyone could come and work for them, irrespective of uh, position in society, um, race or ethnicity, religion. 
you could all go and work for the whaling ships to bring in this, this the great oil from the whale's blubber. And that's why on board the ship, you've got Ishmael and you've got Captain Ahab and then you've got, um, is it the bosun flask and you've got Starbuck from whom Starbuck's coffee gets their name. You've got Queequeg, who is the son of, I think it's a tribal leader in the Pacific. And you've got Dagu as well. So people who are not Americans. Uh, Queequeg always makes me laugh. There's a scene very early on <laughs> where Ishmael meets him. And he's got this curious habit of putting his boots on and off underneath his bed. He has to get under the bed to do it. Um, <laughs> it's just this great little sort of idiosyncrasy of Queequeg's. And so you get to see the lives of the men, the eternal struggle, the, the smallness, the one little iota of who we are in a great sea, ocean, of a mixed up and muddled and foaming and frothing and seething world. The book is a book that's been said, it just grows and grows and grows. It is. It can overwhelm you like a squall with its density of non-narrative chapters about a whaling vessel, about whales themselves, about harpooning, about how spermaceti is used. There is, there's all of that. But then, like I say, the, the church sermon and Queequeg's worship and Starbucks ideas and formalism and Ahab's obsession with the whale and having to fight with it. Um, the whole thing is just so many meanings. There is no single meaning to Moby Dick. Um, some say it's obsession. Some say it's the pursuit of life. Uh, there's just too many strings to the orchestra of Moby Dick. Um, it's just a book you have to read and you may read it and be disappointed and think, wow, that was heavy and dull. But it's a book that if you picked up five years later and reread it, you'd think, wow, this is the greatest book I've ever read. Um, whoever you talk, if you ever do this at a book club or you have done it at a book club, leave a comment down below whether anyone agreed fully in their interpretation of it. People are going to find different meanings in this book for themselves based on their own experience because it is a book about how we engage with the outer world and our innermost feelings. So there's the next book in my book haul, Moby Dick. The next book in this book haul I think needs no introduction whatsoever or even any explanation to be honest. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte the most famous of all the Bronte books, probably the most beloved of all the Bronte books as well. Jane Eyre is high romance. Um, it's high romance with high drama and a great internal monologue going on through Jane Eyre. It's not all just Jane Eyre and Mr. Rochester. If you've read it, you know. I'm sure I'm preaching to a converted choir, generally speaking, here. It starts with Jane Eyre's life um, in, in the orphanage and many a gruelling experience there and how it affects her. And then she leaves and how she becomes set up as a governess. I mean, she survives life in an orphanage almost miraculously. She, Jane Eyre, point, uh, Bronte points out the difficulties for children back then. But she becomes a governess and she meets or is almost run over on the road by Mr. Rochester on his horse. And this is a very sour, although witty, um, it's sort of a sour, injured man who clearly has had troubles in his life, has a very gothic background feel to it. Um, and it, although I wouldn't say it's a full gothic novel, it's got loads of the elements. And if you want a video on the elements that make a gothic novel, here's the link up here. Um, I think you'll really enjoy it. You've got most of those things in Jane Eyre, but the power of Jane Eyre herself is what strikes most people. The ability to see life and live it as you want to live it, to hold fast to your own ideals and standards is what shouts through the pages of this book. 
And no film, according to my wife, who loves Jane Eyre and has watched all the films, actually quite does the book justice. I can tell you I haven't watched all the films. How do you respond to that? Do you have a particular version of the film that you like? If you leave it in the comments below, I'll tell my wife and see what she thinks, because I think she's watched practically all of them. Um, and what do you think of Jane Eyre? Is it your favourite Bronte novel or not? So, that was the next one in the list. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Rounding up the book haul of seven books from Alma Classics for this month is Ivan Turgenev's most famous work, which is Fathers and Sons. Although you'll notice on this cover it's called Fathers and Children because it's argued in the introduction that children is a better translation of the Russian word than sons is. I'm not Russian, so I couldn't tell you, to be quite honest. However, I must say this is the first time I've seen it rendered this way. Every other book I've seen is called Fathers and Sons. The story itself follows in the great Russian tradition of exploring meaning behind things, exploring the underpinning philosophies, worldviews that hold the structure of society together. 19th century Russia was a time full of tumult and churning. Um, uh, especially with the, the the surf act, which released the serfs, which released the peasants from full serfdom, but some of the ideals and and aspects of the code that they wanted for themselves began to fall apart, and it wasn't satisfactory. And this is what Turgenev brings up in this book. You have uh, the main character Arkady, and he goes back home from university to see his father, and he's full of all these new ideas, the student ideas, which, again, think of modern days, isn't it often the students from university who come out propounding the newest theories that have been dreamed up in those celestial towers of thinking and knowledge? Arkady has come home with his friend Barazov, who is a real um, staunch believer in these ideologies is the kind of person that if you get him talking he's never going to shut up he's always on his on his soapbox kind of thing and the ideas they're talking about sort of disturb Arkady's father because he feels he's out of touch now he's tried to visit his son at university to to keep up to date with the latest thinking but it hasn't worked and there's sort of that threat between how things used to be and the older generation and how they see this sweep of change coming. And it's quite a, a vitriolic change. It's, you've got to remember, nihilism, which is what's talked about in this book. In fact, I think it was Tajenev that, that gave nihilism really its meaning and put it into the common vocabulary. Nihilism was a very much a big growth um, in the Russian states and would affect a huge amount of things to come, including the revolution, Bolshevik nihilism. And it's brought out in this. Now, the old guard, or the old ones, the fathers, as it were, they don't like such a dramatic shift, this, this plan to negate everything. Nihilism doesn't mean just giving up. Nihilism means to not put your trust in things, to hold everything almost sceptically. And it was, an, it was a natural outcrop of materialism. How can you set up absolutely perfect structures. You, you shouldn't put faith in anything, according to nihilism. And Barazov expounds it, saying that basically the whole system needs to be brought to naught, to be negated nihilism, and then rebuilt. You can't just tweak it here and there. The whole thing has to come down and be restructured. Um, but there's inherent weaknesses in the argument of that. Because what new structure, why should you put faith in a new structure? Anyway, quite a few things happen in this, and they, there's love interests that appear, and love itself, how should that be viewed? Marriage as an institution, you will find this criticised in numerous of the Russian novels, um, and that's bringing out the thoughts of the day, this nihilistic preaching that was coming out of the universities. And Turgenev engages with it, as does Dostoevsky really well in his works too. And when a thesis, a theory, a philosophy is put into a book and explored in a world created by the author, if the author's good and can keep himself or herself out of it, 
you can really test a philosophy or, or a hypothesis out. And you see Arkady and Barazov coming to trouble with their own theories, which are challenged by two girls that they meet. But you'll have to read it to find out more. In fact, this is one of the books I am reading this month and will be in my book wrap up. And without doubt, I can promise you, it will turn up in a deep dive as well, a deep review of a book. So have you read Fathers and Sons or Fathers and Children as the Alma Classics puts it? Tell me what you thought below. So that's the end of this book haul for this month. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know what you're reading down below or if you've read any of the things mentioned in this video or whether you intend to read some of the things in this video. Um, let me know and who knows, one of these days I might set up a read along. Anyway, until the next video, I wish you joy in your reading.